Hello, I'm Gavin Horgan, Headmaster of Millfield School in Somerset, the largest co-educational boarding school in the UK. Welcome to the Millfield Way podcast. Here, you'll hear from teachers, coaches and students from Millfield and Millfield Prep School. Millfield is traditionally different, and this is the Millfield Way. Hello and welcome to this Millfield Way podcast, in conversation with Millfield Prep's Deputy Head Pastoral, Ben Hilton. My name is Matt Davidson, and I'm delighted to be joined by Ben, who started at MPS in September. So, how have you been, and how has it been, Ben? Oh, it's a breathtaking environment to, to join. I mean, the you know, you, you have the the sort of reputation behind behind a school like this and then to be able to come in and actually see it from the inside is pretty special. Um, for us as a family, we've loved it since September. Um, so before we get into to your role and, and your family as well, what are your interests kind of outside of work, so hobbies that you have? Uh, obviously background of, of professional sport and rugby in particular, um, but I'm, in, I'm into sort of STEM and robotics and, and sort of progressive educational things. I think uh, a school like this, again, with, with the level of opportunity for, for trying to uncover an interest or a, or a dream to, to sort of open a door for a child is pretty awesome. And uh, whether, whether that's been, been sport, drama or academic, um, and, and for us being so active as well as a, as a family, it, it's, um, it, it's been great. For, for me, trying to work out how to get old and still enjoy playing sport is, is the tricky bit now. I might have to move into sort of something like golf or something. Um, so, so you mentioned rugby. You represented England at four different levels in international and international tours. Have you got an all-time favourite rugby hero? I mean, I, I think probably game-changing individuals. Um, so, someone who's a few, just a few years ahead of me were, were, were Jonah Lomu and Johnny Wilkinson, and they obviously took took sort of the rugby world by storm. But um, there were. I mean, Simon Shaw, another one probably a bit similar to me, played until they were quite old and, and did a pretty good job. Sort of role, role models, I guess, yeah. So is it, So, are you still playing rugby now? I'm, I'm trying to when, when I can fit it in, but obviously it's, it's much more difficult and at the level I was, I was trying to play at. So um, with Saturday school as well, that's a, that's a big change for us as a, as a family. Um, but I've managed to squeeze in two or three games. So if I do come in with, with a bruise or a scrape or a black eye or something, it's, uh, it's because of that, not because I'm not doing a good job at work. <laughs> um, so you started at Milford Prep in September and you brought your family um, with you as well. So your children are going through Milford now. How have you kind of found that transition and, and how, how have they found it? Uh, I mean, for, for Jess down in year five, she, she is absolutely grasped everything. She, she's been off competing at regional and national trampolining events she, she's picked up netball and hockey which she was doing very very small amounts back back down in Cornwall um, obviously if, there, if there's something that you want to try this is the place you can try it and for Seb down in year two again I think he's very excited to sort of um, to, to see the level of opportunity he was having in, in year two again probably compared to back home and then with the onlook of, of joining year three and sort of the, the bigger access to the campus and, and things like that, and, and to have the specialist sort of teaching delivery, that, that's the key thing on offer here. And as I know from being uh, as, as a prep head before, sort of being able to rotate children into the, the strengths of staff is a massive advantage. And I think some schools just aren't afforded that luxury because of their, their rigidity in, in timetabling. So you, you were a prep head before. Could you talk about kind of your background and previous roles you had before Millfield? Kind of where yeah, it started? Yeah, I, I, something very, very close, close to, to my heart was, was working down in Bude on the North Cornwall coast um, and uh, supporting the pastoral team in a, in a large school of, of 11 to 18 and, and seeing some of the pressures that the children are under. I think that, that's something that I find to, is, a, is a real passion for me is trying to sort of decode what 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 younger children have got going on and I think it's very easy when you're old and I, I use the analogy often old like us in that um, when we were younger we had pressures of course but I think they are, they are massively amplified uh, and on the, on the back of Covid as well with, with some of the missing sort of ingredients in the toolkit of, of social skills, awareness, uh, routines, all of those things. The that can't be underestimated, and I think um, certainly we, we saw in the secondary school that my wife and I were both working in immediately before 
before coming to Melfield. You know, there, there's some huge challenges there for young people, and obviously, the school is sometimes in a defend, defenderless position of having to work it out as they go and, and provide support and guidance, and that's not easy. And, and equally, children don't, aren't always receptive of that. Um, but yeah, I care about young children. I care about the human side and, and sort of listening to what's going on for them. And I think that's that's only been a help since I've been here. Um, before Budhaven, I, I was the head of a small prep school, um, part of a lar- much larger group though. And again, it was it was about trying to be creative and and you know making every every penny count in the organisation and don't miss an opportunity. And if you can open the, open the door or, or broaden the horizon for a child, especially for us in a small Cornish town, you know, getting them off to big national events and, and the exposure of those sort of things. You know, some of, some of the children in the schools I worked in had never been to London, let alone abroad. And you sort of think, what, what an empowering role that is to, to be able to, to sort of expose children to the wider world. That's, that's amazing. I, th- I think that kind of tees us nicely into the next question about what what inspired you to kind of get into education? But I think you pretty much said it there. It's that kind of uh, well. Well, again, if I'm probably honest, I, I have to. Uh, there's, there's two two things. So I've got my sort of my wife who who is a dedicated teacher from from year dot. I think she sort of went through GCSEs and then through her A levels and was always going to be a be a PE teacher. Um, whereas I I was probably a, your a stereotypical young lad who did, didn't really necessarily know uh, which way to go. Um, I was fortunate enough to, to not be good enough at football to, and my PE teachers to steer me towards rugby, which turned out to be quite a good thing. And then through that, moved into um, some talent ID and, and I moved from part-time, uh, full-time to part-time rugby um, because of where Kirsten was working and made that sort of transition and then started realising or other people sort of identified for me that I was quite good with children. And then also my, my foster parents, my, Margaret was was a lecturer at Plymouth University and, and sort of instilled good educational sort of values in me as well. And do you think that influences kind of all that background into the, the person you are today and how you approach kind of interacting yeah, with children? Yeah, I, I, think, I think that, well, you'd have to ask the children. I mean, I think hopefully I'm, I'm slightly different perhaps to, to a, a more bona fide sort of... Um, you know, lifetime educator or educationalist. I think I, I go for real world scenarios and, and, you know, I think I'm quite relatable. Um, so you completed your first term at PrEP. We're now, we're now well into the spring term. Can you give us an overview of your time here so far? So the kind of key events or how... Uh, I mean, again, it's a very impressive organisation. It's, it's got a lot going on a lot of the time and the, and the days and the weeks go through very quickly. I think um, in in terms of opportunities and events for the children, I mean, you, you almost, you're trying to explain it to previous colleagues at, at other schools or, you know, what your working week looks like, so, talking to friends that work in the city or, or other sort of professional sportsmen. And the, it's the variety. I think that there is absolutely nothing monotonous about working at Millfield. Every day is an adventure. Everything is exciting. And you are busy. And sometimes you're busier than busy, but that's the game, and that, that makes time fly quickly, and and it keeps it exciting, and it's lovely to see see what the kids get up to and be part of that. Okay, uh, so for people who who might not be aware, so your role as deputy head of the prep school, you're in charge of maintaining high standards of pastoral care. Could you kind of tell us the key parts of your role and, and what a week might look like for you i know it's it can vary but yeah lots of lots of things that, that pop up um i mean again i think the the week lays out with with a quite strong start on a monday morning of, of the pastoral committee meeting and that's with sort of 15 maybe 20 key people ranging from uh medical uh all heads of year director of sport um head of it uh, myself as DSL, Depth Head Academic, um, and and sort of all, all the key facets around the school come together. I guess it's like sentinels. I use the the sort of term of, of the sentinels of the school come together and they discuss either issues from the previous week, uh, things that are on the horizon on the on the coming week, in particular, um, sort of some of the the things and the nuances that would be missed in a school that isn't isn't committed and and probably isn't probably isn't resourced in the way that this school is resourced in terms of where they see the priorities 
Um, the priority here for us is, is, is the care of the children. So there's a heavy two hour discussion over, over an individual child or an individual group of children in every class, in every year group. You know, there could be extra, extra issues outside of school, whether it's, um, you know, family staff, whether it's medical issues, whether it's uh, relationship issues within the school, certain characters that clash in every school, obviously. But here, that, to know straight away, you've got the, the ears and the eyes of, of 20 key members of staff that then sort of cascade that down to duty staff, group tutors. It's kind of a, a really holistic um, revolving door of, of sort of awareness, really. Is, is that attention to detail something that you're proud of here? Look. Uh, I, again, I, I feel very blessed in, in that the system was in place with, with my predecessor, Mrs Hazel, who, who is absolutely epic at, at how she's, she's manoeuvred that, that team together. And it's a real fabric of the school, you know, that, that system is in place. Um, and I, I feel I, I've sort of inherited it and I'm very grateful. Um, and it's, it's a key, key performance indicator of the school. That's how we take good care of the children here and how we show them love and support and guidance is by having that meeting that meeting then as I said cascades down into heads of department meetings um, you, you talk about the, the academic pressures on the children we talk about their commitment in terms of the extracurricular clubs and, and we have some quite high functioning children here in terms of sort of their sporting pathways and, and the routes to success that they may be on and it's managing that in a realistic way to make sure they don't get overburdened and, and sort of impacted in a negative way and, and making sure their group tutor is their first port of contact between them and their parents, making sure that we're aware of it within the departments, making sure the departments then feed into the year head, the year heads then bring it to the pastoral meeting. So it's kind of a pyramid and then it flows back down again. So like you mentioned, we've got many pupils here excel in specific kind of disciplines and sporting music or academic how does Milford Prep offer support to these pupils that are kind of in pursuit of their different well paths? again I mean the, uh, my, my commute to work in the morning I'll, I'll, at 7 30 I'll see children out having one-to-one -one specific coaching sessions whether it be tennis netball um, equestrian it might be uh, doing strength and conditioning down, down in the pavilion they could be on the on the in the gym, um, down in the sports hall, there's, there's trampolining. I mean, the, 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 seeing, seeing children on horseback at 7.30 in the morning is, is quite, a, quite a sight. And I think they're, they're, they've been very creative at Millfield in, in allowing every minute of the day to be, to be used in a, in a positive way in some form. And whether that be catch-up academic session, we, we've had a huge performance over, over this week for Matilda with our, with our seniors here and and ranging from children through sort of year five six seven and eight and now they're having sort of catch up sessions to ensure that they the the, the sacrifice of, of certain lessons won't be lost after half term um, and I think the individual program and bespoke sort of I guess is a partnership between parent and child aspirations and then the academic commitment of the school as well in order to build the best package for that child to succeed and, and attend those key events that again probably some schools would find it really difficult to do that and we're quite creative yeah. here with how we allow those doors to be opened that's great is there any aspects of pastoral care that is quite unique to Millfield um, maybe it might be boarding or kind of I think again following on from our pastoral meeting on the Monday we have a house parent meeting with all the boarding house parents as well. And that feeds across from the sort of, I guess, the, I would say they're more blurred than they have been in the past. I think there used to be quite a tradition of boarding houses and boarding community and then school community and day community. And here we're, we're trying to make sure that that's very blended so that we understand things that can impact the children in school will possibly will have manifested outside of school whether they're a day people or a boarder, um, that obviously there, there's some baggage that comes into school and we try and work together with our boarding parents and director of boarding, Mr Bingham, to make sure that, again, children are on people's radars and there's, there's an awareness there that um, if someone is needing some extra support or they're particularly tired or they've got a certain big event coming up or a big performance or musical gradings or, you know, it very much works together in order for us to 
to give the support and the guidance, but also the reassurance because being being a, a high boarding school, um, that, that's different for some people and trying to understand when you're in it versus when you're outside of it looking in, it's a very unique place. Yeah. So for those listening that might have perceived ideas about boarding based on schools they might have been to or, or heard about, what would you kind of say to them in, in how it's changed and what you, you make of it now? Uh, I think it's a lot more relaxed, I think, than, than perhaps perception might, might give. Um, obviously, if you can imagine having a house with, with 30 plus children of, the, of a similar age in it and, and, uh, and, and the, the, the rigmarole and the, the challenge that that might be as being a house parent, I think my hat goes off to them. I think it's amazing what they do. Um, but I, I've spent a few evenings in the boarding houses and it's just such a love, loving environment and I think it is a home from home. Um, I guess probably a bit like a residential school camp, I guess, would be to, to, to a non-experienced person. It, it might might be a good analogy to give. Sure, children, children have good days and bad days, as, as they do when they come home if you're a day pupil at any school. Um, but they've got a lot more support. They're in, in, in small dorms with their friends. They've got uh, every house has got a games room. They've got their own outdoor courts and, and play space. Um, I went past uh, a couple of girls last night on my way to collect uh, some some of the cast from the Matilda performance, and I saw children going around on scooters and skateboards. And uh, you know, as I drove past the next boarding house, they were they were playing playing football and basketball. I mean, it's it's a very, very um, yeah, very calm, relaxed, and, and friendly place for them to be. Would Would you say that kind of in the modern age now where we are there's more kind of guidance training awareness of people that work in boarding houses than there yeah i mean again you for our age range in particular it, it's parenting you know I genuinely do believe that where, where we use the term house parents this isn't a teacher that just happens to look after children this this is a, a very um a very comparable on a slightly greater scale obviously um, of having a mum or a dad figure, you know, that actually is there every day for them and to be that kind of bridge between school and home and also from the boarding house to, to their actual family home as well because some of our children here are thousands or hundreds of thousands of miles away from their, their home. And, and sort of if you're not a boarding parent, if you're not, your children aren't in a school in a different country, you can only imagine the level of trust and care that you, you're you're kind of signing up for and expecting. And I think that our high boarding numbers show that people are seeing the value in what we do and, and that's really reassuring for me as, as the head of the pastoral side. Um, have you got a particular philosophy in, in how you teach or how you approach teaching? Uh, I, I think, again, try, trying to sort of keep it real for the children, make it, make it an actual world example. You know, the, there's... Where are you going to need it? Why is this a good example? Can you think of how this relates to your life, your parents' lives, your siblings' lives, um, I think is, is always a good, a good way for me to, to sort of help them connect the dots. Um, I'm probably a bit of a, a believer in sort of like, I call it trick learning, which is a, a, a pretty low level, level term, but it, there's normally a moral or a message in what I'm saying. And, you know, I try and steer the children into to sort of waking up and, and catching that bit and making their own connection at the end. So, um, yeah, I think keeping things practical, giving real life examples is important and, and making everything as broad as you possibly can to, to show diversity, understanding and well-rounded humans, which is obviously what we're trying to create, hopefully. It's good, good citizens of the future. Do you, do you think anything has changed from when you, you started teaching to now? Like how you teach or maybe how kind of you approach lessons? Uh, I think... Probably, it, it can be. It can go two ways. I think originally there was a lot of freedom, and then the education got much tighter, and, and you're chasing national curriculum levels, and you're you're chasing SAT scores, and you're then into league tables and things like that. And I think the pressure sometimes under over schools is is oh, it can be overwhelming. And I think ultimately, when you get into that environment, the children are probably who miss out. <clears throat> I think. Having, having a well-balanced approach and being sort of being able to stand behind what you do and believe why you do it that way is, is a massive um, 
advantage for the independent sector. Obviously, the, the national curriculum is, is there, but there's the international primary curriculum. You, you've got other choices that you can make if you're creative. Um, and, and I'd like to think try, trying to have an ethos in every school that can be different it would be a wonderful thing. And I think sometimes you, you don't want a conveyor belt or a factory. And sometimes I think sometimes because of external or political pressures, schools can fall into that that column and it can be quite difficult to get back out. Um, so you mentioned that you've you kind of you taught sports before um, and throughout your teaching career, you've had experience in, in coaching sports. At Millfield Prep, we're, we're proud of the multi-sport provision that we provide to pupils. Um, do you believe that it gives kind of young people the chance to try out a massive variety of sports? Oh, absolutely. I mean, I, 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 a perfect example is this morning in assembly, I saw four of my most talented rugby players collecting, uh, under 11 level, collecting um, medals and tro- uh, certificates for the coming second or third in, in the in the regionals or, or the southern championships for table tennis. Completely opposite end of the scale, I guess, in terms of playing a contact sport and then playing table tennis. But what a, what a great opportunity and, and you know, for, for one of the boys in the rugby team in particular, a boy from Spain who'd never held a rugby ball before. And he, he, it, it now shows he's one of our strongest rugby players in the year group. And had he not come to Millfield, had he, he may never have held a rugby ball. And what a shame that would be. And we've, we, we could replicate that across a number of sports here that children just find something, try it. And, and whether they're a high level ability or not, they, they've got a choice. And I think, again, the more equipment, the more facilities they can experience, the more equipment they can put in their hands, they might uncover something. So we've got a, um, uh, a previous head of school at the senior school called Noah, who um, is in the rugby team, but he's also very keen on dance, and he's been in lots of plays and lots of musicals. Is that something that now is good for people's kind of, they can try out rugby, they can try out dance, whereas before it might not have been perceived as kind of the norms that people would have... have yeah, I mean, I, th- I think, again, probably getting away from the independent sector, sometimes there's not the time or the resource available or the commitment for the child to be able to do multiple things at the same time. And so they're, they're probably forced to specialise quicker and then they can fall into a, an a, t- a stereotypical, they're into only drama or they're into only football or they're into only um, music, whereas in an environment like this they, they can actively pursue multiple sort of strings to their bow and I think um, why shouldn't they do that I mean I, I, I use an example often about yoga pilates ballet for NFL players uh, and, and very very large very very strong athletes in, in terms of sort of your, your rugby wrestling um, and, and again yeah American football in particular uh, and some of their core, some of their core professional sports in life will be working on their core, core stability, their muscles. They'll be doing yoga, ballet, pilates, and that only aids aids their performance in their main sport. So I think having the multi sport approach at prep, even though we have a number of children that are on various sort of elite pathways and things, being able to experience different things. A classic would be swimming, where they may be tipped to be a, a very strong international swimmer one day and then actually by the time they turn 15, 16, 17 they might move across into biathlon, triathlon, water polo but they've got that grounding of the sports but then they've, they've combined something else and, and you know looking at the Australian model of talent identification and seeing that you can be genetically suited to certain sports and you may never have tried them you know what an exciting thing to be able to say well I'm, a, I'm only into one thing but Similar to my own story, I, I was I was destined to be a footballer until a person said, you should really try holding a rugby ball and then sort of 16, 18, 20 England caps and 50 county caps later, turns out the PE teacher had a good opinion of me and it worked well. <laughs> um, so you you tried out football and rugby when you were younger. If you think you were a child at Millfield Prep back in the day, would you? Is there anything you would have tried that you maybe didn't have the chance to when you were younger? Uh, I, I probably would have would have gone more for the the music. I think now looking back with a very old old head, I'm I'm so incredibly envious. I mean, you go to any of our cushion concerts and you see some of our music scholars, and genuinely you can sit there as as a as a very, you know, very very mature. I won't mention my age, but a very very mature um, 
we'll say young adult, but I'll say <laughs> approaching middle age. And you're in absolute awe and, and very envious of, of 11, 12-year-old children that can do something that I can categorically say, I cannot do that. Mm. And how many other how many other environments can you work in as an adult and then be in awe of somebody a third of your age and be able to say, I'm good at lots of things, I can't do that. Yeah. And then you'll be in a classroom talking to them and then if you can sort of share that respect, it's like a reciprocal kind of thing that they'll then listen to your knowledge and at the same time you can say I massively respect what you can do I'd love to be able to do that and that, that should be the way life should be I think seeing the sort of positives in others definitely it's, it's not been long since you've been here but are there any kind of successes that you're proud of already I know we had a lot of pupils in the Lambda City Lambda exams is there anything that stands out to you at your time here so far I think, I think just the, the bits that have, that have stood out is the sort of the celebration of, of children's achievements and and um, Looking at, as I said, in the in the rewards assembly, seeing certificates for for art, for drama, for music, for sport. For we had groups of children going off to math challenges. We've got a chess champion down down in year six. You know, hearing those things. I mean, the house singing. I mean, seeing children again. I, unfortunately, I, I have lots of skills, but music and dance are neither. And um, being able to watch children perform to the way the way that they did in the house song or the carol service. I mean, they're magical marquee kind of showcases for the children. And probably people don't see the level of, and with Matilda as well, people don't necessarily see the, the level of work and the level of commitment asked upon staff or children. But you see the event. And when you're in, in a school like this, you see the commitment and the passion that's put in. But you only sometimes you only see the end result. And I think having that, understanding of how that people work together to achieve those things is, is really impressive is it, so it's almost that process isn't it kind of seeing it's also kids when they're in the lessons as well a lot of teachers say the reason why they love teaching is kind of that when a child realizes what it is and how they work it out and that yeah. kind of oh i, I get it now it's so a, bit, a, a bit like my sort of my analogy of trick learning yeah and then you see the penny drop or the dots yeah, connect and you're like that's amazing yeah yeah um, so, is there any kind of not future plans, but anything you're looking forward to for the for the remainder of this year? Anything? Well, obviously, the awkward thing for me is being new. That everything is new. So, <laughs> and, and once you've been here a little while, people sort of assume you you know everything. Um, and as I'm as I'm seeing now, in terms of various meetings, or this always happens in the spring, and I'm sort of thinking like a complete newbie going. <laughs> No, don't know that. Not seen it before. Yeah. So I'm I'm often chasing my tail on on certain pieces of either a certain meeting or um, we we were talking about transition for for children from year eight to year nine, and obviously I had no idea that that meeting happened. Um, we've got transitions from year two to year three. We've got scholarship applications and awards meetings, and um, you know the the Matilda performances, and then we roll into. Easter and spring concerts and things like that so obviously it's hard being new and not seeing those before because when you've been here for a period of time people just assume you are fully informed yeah. so I'm, I'm enjoying the uh, the fact that I'm perennially slightly behind everyone else the, the constant surprise when yeah. another event pops up of course I knew that was going to happen <laughs> I'm right on it um, so the final question I know, I know you've only been here for a short amount of time but if you could sum up Millfield Prep in three takeaways what would what would they be? Uh, I would say broad horizons, an incredible learning environment, and hugely dedicated staff. Well, I think that's a perfect way to end the podcast. Uh, thank you very much for joining me today, Ben. Um, and I hope you enjoyed this episode of the Millfield Way podcast in conversation with Millfield Prep's Deputy Head Bustle.